on the streets or on Kampara Road. This was designed just for instructional purposes. Instructional means for teaching purposes, just to help in the teaching, systems programming, or systems software. Because you remember, when we were starting to discuss systems programming, we said that it is important to understand the hardware first because the systems programs run on hardware. They are the ones which interface with the hardware first before the application software is brought in. So since we have got different hardwares, like you know, we have got quite very many manufacturers of computers. So these guys found it a bit difficult to find something which would suit every manufactured computer. So they designed what we call a simplified instructional computer just to bring out only those important topics which are covered in systems programming. So this is the computer we are going to be talking about. Now, we have been dealing with the Intel 885 machine. So far, we have been using those examples of the Intel 885 machine. Now, as we discuss the instructional computer, it would be good that you remember or you go on noting the differences between the Intel and this computer, which we are going to be talking about. Okay. So, let us begin. Now, the simplified instruction computer, like we are saying on the screen there, it has got two versions. We have what we call the simple version, that one is usually referred to as the just the SIC, CIC, instructional computer. That is the standard version. And then it has got an XCE version. XCE meaning extra resources. So this one has got more, the XCE, it has got more functions than the simple. That's why these people, some people prefer to call it, to call the XCE, extra equipment, or extra expensive. So when we talk about this instructional computer, we will be specifying whether we are dealing with the simple version, we will be referring to it as just the simple SIC, or the SIC XCE, that means the extra version, okay? Now, let us talk about the sick, the simple sick first. Now, you remember when you were talking about the Intel 885 in the last lecture, we said that a word for Intel is two bytes. So two bytes in Intel make up a word. With the simple SIC, it is three bytes, consecutive bytes. So when you combine three bytes consecutively, which means 24 bits, those three bytes make up a word. So sometimes we will be talking about Sometimes we will be talking about a byte, and sometimes we will be talking about a word. So whenever we talk about a word, it is important that you remember that a word is three bytes. In other words, 24 bits, okay? Now that is the memory it has. The total memory is the two to power 15. Remember Intel, since Intel has got 
like you remember the address of Intel is 16 bits. So the total amount of memory for Intel is two to power 16. But the total amount of memory for the simple SIC is two to power 15. Three bytes and the memory is two to power 15. Okay. It has got registers. This one is very simple because we have got only five registers. We have got only five registers. Remember the Intel 885? We had many registers. Remember we had those four registers which we find in the control unit, the program counter, the instruction register, the processor status word, and then the stacker pointer. Then we also had six general purpose registers. Like you remember, we had register B, register C, register D, register H, and register L. Okay. Now this one has got only a total of a total of five registers. The first register is the accumulator. Its abbreviation or mnemonic will be using A. A to mean the accumulator. And its code is zero. So these codes are given in hexadecimal. Okay. Remember, the accumulator in Intel, it had a code. Can someone remember the code for the accumulator in Intel? One, one, one. Yeah, it was one, one, one. Okay. Now this one is zero, 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 because each of these, each of these numbers you see is a hexadecimal number, which has the four bits. So the accumulator in a, the simple seek is zero, 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 zero. Okay. So there is another register which we call the index register. So its code is a one, okay? Now index register is used for addressing. Now, I don't know if you remember the addressing modes we discussed. Remember we discussed the immediate addressing mode, the register addressing mode, the direct, the best, and then I remember we talked about the index or indexing. Remember indexing, we said that this is going through, let me say an array, maybe incrementing by a certain number. You could be incrementing by one, 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 like we do in C when we say I plus plus. Okay. Or you would, but this one can allow you to increment in it too. So the number you are incrementing is usually put into that register, which we call the index register. And then you start incrementing it in order to get to the required memory location which you want to access. So the index register whose code is a one is used for index addressing, okay? Then we have another register which we call like register L. Its code is a two. L stands for linkage register, linkage register. Now, the use of the linkage register is that the jump to subroutine instruction stores the return address in this register. Now, this one might not be for those of you who want to cram. It might not be very easy to cram, but I want you to understand when I mention its function. Now, you know, when we are programming, sometimes we find functions. And you remember, I mentioned that when you are going to execute a function, we usually call that one a jump. We, and you remember we said that we have got two types of branches. We had the conditional and then the Nani conditional branch. Okay. So whenever you branch, maybe to execute a function, we know that time will come when you will be coming back to the main program. Now it means 
that you have to remember the address where you will return it to when you return it from the main proof. When you return it from the function, you have to remember the address where you will return it to in order to complete the rest of the program. So in order to remember the address, that linkage register stores the address where you will return it to when you return it from executing a function. Now, when we go to execute a function, these guys have an instruction called jump to subroutine. So jump to subroutine is an instruction which enables you to go and execute a function. So you say jump to subroutine, maybe mark. It means that you go and first execute a function called mark. But time will come when you will need to come back to the main program. So when you say jump to subroutine mark, you have to note the address that when I return from mark, where will I begin from in the main program? So the linkage register stores the address, which is the return address. That means where you will return it to. So that is why we say that that linkage register, the jump to subroutine instruction will store the return address in this register. So the jump to subroutine instruction has got two functions. The first function, it first stores the return address where you will return it to in the main program. And that address is stored in the linkage register. Then after storing that return address, then the program will go and you will execute the subroutine or the function. Okay. So that is the use of the linkage register. That is a register which stores the return address when the jump to subroutine instruction has been given. Then we have the program counter whose code is eight. It is like all the other program counters. We know the function of the program counter. The program counter, can someone remember what it does? Yeah, uh, a program counter contains contains flags. Uh, which flags can tell us the current status of a comp or the CPU, and then they can tell us the effects uh, the effects of a particular like uh, an instruction that has been executed. What are its results on the CPU? Mm -hmm. No, that is no. a status word. That is a process a program that counter which it tells us the status. But the program counter, what does it do? It holds the address of the next instruction. Exactly. The program counter holds the address of the next instruction. So when you are going, whenever you are going to execute an instruction, then the program counter will be the one or the register which will be holding the address of the next instruction. Okay. Then the processor status word, these guys just call it the status word. It is the one which has got you flags, which tell us what has happened and maybe the nature of the what? Of the answer which you have obtained. That's why we call it the status word. It gives us the status of the processor, all of the status of the answer, the nature of the answer, okay? So those are the five registers for the, those are the five registers for the simple seek. Okay? Now data formats, okay? Now this one, you should be able to note, integers are stored as 24-bit binary numbers. So every integer for these guys is stored in 24 bits. Every integer consumes 24 bits. So even if you have a simple number like a five, five we know in binary is 0101, 
So it means you have to write like 21 bit, one, 21 zeros in the front. Then you will write 0101 to make it. No, it, it, it will be, how many will it be? 20, you have to write 20 zeros first. Then you write as the other 0101 to make it 24 bits. So every integer is stored as a word. Remember we said the word is three bytes, 24 bits. So every integer is stored in 24 bits, okay? Now, if it is a negative number, we use the two's complement format. We use the two's complement format to, talk, to store negative numbers. Remember, inside the machine, you can't put a negative sign. Inside the machine, you can't put a negative. So you remember when you were doing architecture, you remember the methods which we use to represent negative numbers. Remember we talked about the two's complement and we talked about the sign magnitude. Now these guys use the two's complement format to represent negative numbers, okay? Now, if it is a character, just like in the Intel, a character will be taking only eight bits using its CSKI code. So in the memory, when you store a character, Hello, do you hear me now? Does any... Yes, we do. Okay, uh, maybe my screen had gone off. I'm sorry, the internet is not very much, not be very good. Okay. So I was saying that if it is a character, a character will be stored using 80 bits. So this one you have to note that when it is an integer, an integer is stored as a word. It consumes, every integer consumes the three bytes. But if it is a character, the character will take only one byte, that is 80 bits, and then it will use the ASCII codes, okay? So the simple version, it does not handle floating point numbers. So the simple seek hardware, does not handle floating point numbers. It handles only integers and the characters, okay? Now, this one is also a very simple one. When you come talk about machine language instruction formats, remember when we talk about the machine language instruction format, it has got two parts. There is always an opcode and then the operand, okay? Now, we saw we have got different formats with the Intel. Remember, we have a format for register to register transfer, which is just only one byte, where you begin with the zero one, then you mention the destination register, then you mention the source register. We saw how to add. It has got an opcode, and then the operand is the source register. We saw how to subtract. We saw how to put immediate data into a register. Now you remember those were different formats. Every instruction had its own format. But for the simple seek, we have got only one format, okay? So the instruction with the simple seek takes three bytes, 24 bits. So every instruction with a simple seek is a three bytes, 24 bits. The first 80 bits, that is the opcode, okay? Then there is bit number nine, which we indicate as the X. And that one means it indicates the addressing mode, okay? So like if this is binary, it means that, and it is only one bit, it means we have only two addressing modes because there are only two possibilities for that bit number nine. 
it can either be a zero or a one, okay? So that flag indicates the addressing mode which is being used. We are going to talk about it later. Then the remaining 20, 15 bits, they stand for the address. So it means that each of these instructions, you talk about the op code, and then the operand has to be an address. So you talk, you can talk about, let me say, RDX, eh? because you are talking about the address of X. You can't say RD5, because the five is immediate data, it is a reg it is what? It is an integer. So you can't say add the five, but you can say add the X, which means that all operands have to be in memory. And then you need the only to mention the what? The address. So which addressing mode is that? Where you have the operand is in memory and the instruction is just you just mentioned the address does anybody remember that type of addressing mode no it is not indirect you remember those examples which I gave where I said that you can have XZ is equal to X plus Y, where X and Y are memory locations. So the instruction has got only addresses. How did we call that mode? Direct address. Exactly, so that is direct addressing. So here we have got only two addressing modes, okay? The one where that... Okay? So we have got two addressing modes. We have got the direct addressing mode and the index addressing mode. So here we have got only two addressing modes, you remember? I told you that whenever we discuss the seek machine, we should always have a picture how those particular features are handled in the Intel 8085. Remember Intel, has the goal, we discussed a number of addressing modes. We discussed immediate, direct, register, base, index, and so on. But here we have got only two index and a direct. So when a bit number nine is a zero, that means direct addressing, okay? So it means that the address where the operand is, because you remember addressing modes are meant to help us find where the operand is the R. Are they in memory? Are they in registers? Those are addressing modes, okay? So since we have said that these ones, every operand has to be in memory, it means we, are, we have to find a memory location where the data we want to use is located. So if it is direct, it means that the, that particular memory location which has got the required data which we call the target address, is that address which is given in the 15 bits. So that is the target address. Remember we have got, we have got the address which is 15 bits. So when X is zero, it means the address which has got the required operand is that one which is in the 15 bits. But when X is a one, when X is a one, the addressing mode is the index addressing. And you remember we said that when we are talking about the index address, we have to use the index register. Remember we have got the index register. Okay? So when X is one, the addressing mode is index addressing. 
So how do we calculate the target address? You take that address, which is in the 15 bits, and then you add what is in register X, okay? So take the address, which is given in the 15 bits, plus what you have in register X. So that will take you to the target address, which has got the required operand, okay? So when we write X within the bracket parenthesis, that means that we are talking about the contents of register X. So register X will be having a number. So the number which you find in register X, you will take that number. And to that number, you will add the address which is given in the 15 bits. That will take you to the target address. The target address, that means that is the address of the required operand. So if I say, for example, add num, it means I want to find out the particular memory location in num. Okay, so num my, my what? My target address. It's calculated using those two modes. If it is direct, then whatever is in the 15 bits will be num. If X is a one that is index addressing, it means the num will be what you have in the 15 bits plus what you have in the index register. Okay. Is that so far? Is that a good? Is that a understood so far? Any query? Okay. Mm -hmm. So let us continue. Now the instructions themselves, here we are talking about the assembler language instructions. Charlotte, what do you want me to repeat? You are saying I beg your pardon. Is there something you want me to explain more? The part about X, I said, if we can go back here, we said that we have got only one machine language instruction format. We have got only one format. So every instruction, we mean the machine language instruction, you begin with an op code, which is in the first eight bits. Okay. Then bit number nine is a flag. That is what we call X. The name of this flag is X. So that bit number nine, it can be a zero or it can be a one because these are binary numbers. And then the remaining 15 bits, that is the address. And we, we have said that if the address is the one which is given in the instruction, we said that that is direct addressing, okay? So in this case, it means that all the operands have to be fetched from memory. We don't have operands in registers. We don't have immediate operands. Every operand has to be fetched from memory. Now, since memory has got very many memory locations, it means that we have to calculate the address, okay? Now, the machine language instruction, which is 24 bits, the last 15 bits is the address. So we are saying that when X is zero, we are saying that when X is zero, the address which is given in the 15 bits is the target address. That means the target address means the address which has got the operand which we need to complete the instruction, okay? So if that bit number nine is a zero, it means that you are going to do it. You are go the target address is just what you have in the 15 bits. But when X is a one, we said that that is the index addressing. Now to calculate the target address, you take the address which is given in the, the other 15 bits plus contents of register X. Remember we said that we have got register X, which we call the index register. So you take a contents of register X, and then you add what you have in the 15 bits. 
that will take you to the target address. That means the address which has got the required operand. Is it okay now? Charlotte, is it fine now? You are hearing me? Yes, it's okay. So let us continue. Now the assembler language instructions we have just a few we can talk about here. Like we saw in the in the Intel, we have an instruction which says the load the accumulator. Remember the operand here, we are saying that all of these instructions, all of these instructions, the operand is a memory location. So when I say load the accumulator, the operand I will give is an address of a memory location. That means go to memory at that particular address and pick whatever you find and bring it into the CPU in the accumulator. Now these guys also have got instructions which can load register X directly without going to the accumulator. So there is an instruction which says load X. That means you can pick any data from memory and bring it into the what? And bring it into the index register. Then we, we also have a store the accumulator. That means you take a contents of the accumulator and then you store those contents in memory. It is the reverse of loading. Okay. We have store X, which means that we are taking what is in the register X and storing it to a memory location, which you will have to mention. We have an instruction add. Remember all of these instructions, the operand is a memory location. The operand is an address. So like in Intel, when I say, for example, add num, it means that I want you to add what is in the memory location in num to what is in the accumulator. And the answer will be in the accumulator. When I say, for example, subtract num, it means that I will take what is in register A and I subtract what is in the memory location in num. Okay. Multiply, divide, it is the same thing. Okay. The operand is always an address. So what I have written in blue there is what I have been explaining that all arithmetic operations involve register A and a word in memory. That means an integer in memory. The result is always in register A. Okay. We have an instruction which we call a compare. Comp, it means a compare. Now this instruction it compares what you have in the accumulator <clears throat> with what you have in the given memory location. For example, you can say compare num, comp num. It means I want you to take what is in register A and compare it with what is in memory location in num, okay? Now, when we compare, we usually want to know what we should do next after comparing numbers. Now we usually compare by subtracting. For example, if I, if I say compare num, I, I wish you have a pen where to write. If I say comp num, okay, that is the same thing as taking what is in the accumulator and you subtract what is in the memory location in num. Now, when you subtract, you can get three types of answers. Mm? You can get a positive answer, you can get a negative answer, or you can get a zero. I think those are the only alternatives when you subtract. Either the answer you get is positive, or the answer you get is negative, or you get a zero. 
Now, if I subtract, for example, a subtract num, and I get a positive, which of these numbers is greater than the other? X or num or contents of the accumulator? If I get a positive answer, Okay, it means the contents of the accumulator, which is register A is greater, okay? What happens if I get zero? If I get a zero, what happens? It means what is in register A and what is in memory location in num are equal, that A and the num are equal. And similarly, when I get a negative answer, it means that num, all contents of num are the ones which are bigger than what is in the accumulator, okay? So that is how we compare. We compare and then we examine the answer, whether we get a greater than, whether we get equal, or whether we get less than, okay? So after that, after comparing, Usually, we can make a jump. Remember, when I was explaining about branches, especially conditional branches, I said that you can say, if X is greater than Y, then you can jump to a function, okay? So here you examine, you compare, and you find whether you are getting greater than or whether you are getting equal, or whether you are getting less than. So after that, then you can jump. So those conditional jump instructions are jump if less than, jump if equal, or jump if greater than. So whenever you compare, you can get a less, equal, or greater, okay? So you can jump if less than, jump if equal or jump if greater than, okay? Then we have another instruction which we saw, like the jump to subroutine. I think I explained that when I was explaining the function of register L. We said that it has got two functions, that instruction jump to subroutine. It will restore first the return address in the what, in register L, and then it will jump to a given memory location. So when I say jump to subroutine mark, it means I will store the return address first into register L, and then I go and execute the function mark, okay? Then when you return, when you have finished executing, executing a function, there is usually an instruction which says return from subroutine. And that is how we write it, return from subroutine. So when that instruction is given, it means that you go to register L and read what was stored there, then that is the memory location where you will return it to. So the return from subroutine return is the program to a memory location whose address is contained in the register L. Okay. Any question about that? We continue? Okay. Then how do we input and output? Yeah. So when we are inputting, of course we are input, we can be inputting, let me say from a keyboard. Okay. So these are instructions whenever if we are going to input, this is simple seek takes in one byte at a time. OK? 
Okay. Remember, we said that when we input, if it is a character, the ones that we type on the keyboard, a character is 80 bits. Okay. So when we input, whatever we input will go to the accumulator. Now the accumulator, remember we said is also 24 bits. Actually, all registers are 24 bits. Okay. 24 bits that it means is three bytes. Okay. So when I input, that is one byte. So the character which I input will go to the rightmost byte. Okay, because there are three bytes in the accumulator, but the byte which will receive what you are inputting will be the one which is on the right. Similarly, when we are outputting, the, the byte which goes out, for example, if you are outputting it to a printer, the byte which will go out is the one which is in the rightmost part of the register because a register has three bytes. But the byte which is on the right is the one which receives the input and it is the one, the one where the output comes from. Okay. Now, if we are going to input data or to output data, we have to mention the device which is giving us the data or the device where we are outputting. So these guys here are specific. You mentioned the device which is giving you the data or the device where you are going to output. So that device, those devices are given by codes. So every device has a code which is 80 bits. Okay. So a, a keyboard has got its own code, a mouse has its own code, a printer has its own code, and so on. So each device has its code. So that when you say inputting, you mention the device, you give the code of the device, which is going to input. Okay. Now we have got three instructions which we use for inputting and outputting. Okay. The first instruction is what we call a test device. Test device. Okay. So if you are going to input data, okay, that is the first instruction you give. Test device. That means you want to know whether the device is ready to provide the data. Okay, otherwise you can pick and require the information. So the device has to be ready. Similarly, when you are outputting, you have to test the device first. Okay, in order to find out whether the device is ready or not. So you can say test device keyboard, test device printer. Remember, we are saying that here we use. Here we use what? We use the codes for the device. But what I'm saying is that for every byte which you want to read, or for every byte which you want to output, you have to test the device first. Now, when you test, you expect one of the two answers. Either the device is ready or the device is not ready. So if the device is ready, the answer you get is less than. If the device is busy, that means if it is not ready to receive data, or if it is not ready to provide the data, the answer you get when you test is equals, okay? So here you will say that we will say jump if equal. So if we equal, it means go, and they do something else because the device is busy. But when we say jump if less than, it means that we are going to do something to start inputting or outputting because the device is now available. So those are the two answers we get. You set this test device, and then you examine the answer you get. If you get less than, it means that the device is ready, you can send or receive data. 
If you get equals, it implies that the device is busy. Okay. Now, another instruction is read the data or read the device. Now, after knowing that the device is ready, then you can give an instruction, read the data. So this one will read the data from a device when the device is ready. But you remember it is reading one character at a time. And when you return it to read the second character, you again test because anything can happen whenever you are inputting. You don't take it for granted that you can input, let me say, 80 characters because initially the device was ready. No. For every character you read, you have to test the device. Okay. Then write device or write data. So this one is writing data to a what? To a device. Okay. So the at sequence is repeated for every byte of data which is read or written. Okay. So that is sequence. Every character you test first, then you read. You test first, then you write. Okay. Every character. Okay. So that one is also okay. Yes. Okay. So now let us now talk about the XCE version. Remember, we said that we have got two types of SIC. We have the simple SIC and the SIC XCE. XCE is the extended version or the extra equipment version. Now, the XCE has got more memory. Okay, it's a memory is two to power 20. Does anybody remember the memory for the simple SIC? Two to power 15. Okay, yeah, the simple SIC was two to power 15, but the extended version is the SIC XCE. Its memory is two to power 20, which is one megabyte. That is very little memory anyway. Now registers, this extra version, the CKXE version, has got more registers. Remember the other one who had only five registers, the accumulator, register X, register L, the program counter, and the status word. Okay. But this one combines the registers which we saw in the simple version plus these other four registers. So there is a register B whose code is a three. That is a base register. And we use the base register for base addressing. I hope you remember the addressing mode which we call the base addressing, okay? Base addressing, you remember, you are given a number which is the base, it can be in a register or a memory location. And then you add your what? You add another number, which we call the displacement. Okay, so that is the best addressing. Its code is three. Remember, these are hexadecimal numbers. So if you convert those codes to binary, this will be 0011. It is a three. Then we have registers the S and the T, those are general purpose registers, general working registers. You can use them for anything. Just like we have these other registers for Intel, you remember the general purpose registers for Intel. Register B, C, D, E, H, L. So that is for Intel, they have six working registers. These guys, they have got only two register S and register T, and those are their codes. So those ones are general purpose registers. You can use them for anything. You can use them for arithmetic operations, or you can use them for addressing, okay? Then we have register F. Its code is a six. 
So this one is a floating point accumulator. A floating point accumulator. Remember the accumulator is used for arithmetic operations. Okay. So it means that the accumulator, which is register A, is used for arithmetic operations which don't involve floating point numbers. But if you are going to handle floating point numbers, then you have to use register F. So that one is the floating point accumulator and its code is a six, okay? I usually ask people to highlight differences between the simple seek and the XCE. Or I ask people to compare the Intel and the XCE I think in both cases, you can compare them, okay? Now, data formats, remember for the simple seek, we said that we have got only, we talked about like three data formats. Remember we said that if it is an integer, we said that it is stored in three bytes, which is a word. And we said that if that particular integer is a negative number, that one is stored as a two's complement number. And then we said that if uh, your voice is on and off. Yeah, I'm sorry. Someone is asking me to repeat your reason for register F because you were on and off. Do you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, but sometimes it gets off and on. Okay, so you are at me. So I, if it is register F, if I can repeat that, I said that register F is the one which is used to handle floating point numbers. So if you are going to perform an arithmetic operation, which involves a floating point number, then you don't use the accumulator, which is register A. You use a floating point accumulator, whose code is a six. Then in memory, we said, sorry. Okay, then in data formats, this is what I was explaining. Okay, I said that for the simple seek, we said that you can have integers which are stored as a word, every integer consumes the 24 bits. Then we said if it is a negative number, it also it is also stored in 24 bits, but using the two's complement format. And we said that if it is a character, that one is stored in 80 bits using its ASCII code. But now with the XCE, the CXCE, this one handles floating point numbers. Remember, we said that for the simple seek, we don't handle floating point numbers. But the XCE handles the floating point numbers. And every floating point number consumes the 48 bits. So those are how many bytes? I think those are 60 bytes, okay? So if you are going to talk about a floating point number, that one will consume six bytes. If it is an integer, an integer consumes only three bytes. A floating point number will consume 48 bits. Now from architecture, I think you can remember the format of a plot floating point number. We usually have a sign, whether because the number can be a negative or a positive. We usually talk about the exponent and then the fraction. So since these are 48 bits, the first bit is always the sign bit, which can be a zero or a one. The next 11 bits, that is the exponent. Now this exponent is in excess of 10 to 24. And then the fraction is usually put into 36 bits, okay? So that is the format. You have to remember that particular format because I can give you a question and say, 
How will a number let me say like a negative 12? How is it stored in the CKXCE? Okay. All negative 12.5. How is it stored in the CKXCE? So if it is a negative 12, that is an integer. It means you convert that number to a 2z complement. I hope you remember how to convert to 2z complement. Okay. And then it has to be in three bytes, 24 bits. But if it is a floating point number, this one has to be in 48 bits. Maybe if I can pause there because this is important. Can you calculate or can you let me know how you can indicate negative 12 as a seek XCE, a seek, otherwise this XCE and a simple seek is the same for integers. Every integer is three bytes. If it is negative, it is stored using the to the complement format. Can you work out and tell me how you will restore a negative 12? Negative 12. An idea? Or do you want me to remind you? Uh, you remind us. I want me to remind you you have forgotten architecture. Okay. So the first step, if it is a negative 12, the first step is to convert it to binary. Can you convert negative 12 to sorry to the number 12 to binary? And then so 12 to binary. And then you put zeros in front because the total has to be 24 bits. If you can tell me the last four bits, what will it be the last four bits? Okay. So that is 1100. Zero, zero. Very good. So it means in front we have to add the 20 zeros, not so, because it has to be 24 bits, three bytes. Yeah. So in front of 1100, you have to add, I think, 20 zeros. Is that right? Then when you have a number in a binary, can someone remember how we convert, if you have it in a binary, how you convert it to the complement? I think we invert the, the bit values. And then we add one. Exactly. So you invert those bits. The zeros will become ones. The ones will become zero. So that result you get, then you add a one. Okay. So can someone tell me the answer in the hexadecimal? The last, we invert the bits. That means wherever there is a zero, you put, you replace a zero with the one. Wherever, wherever there is a one, you replace that one with the zero. That's what we mean by inverting. Then you add the one. It is not after 
the zeros are before the 1100 because if you put them after, then you are changing the magnitude of the number. So the zeros have to be in front. Has anybody got the answer? Are you working, ladies and gentlemen? Okay, very fine. So that is F, 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 four. Very good. Okay. So that is the answer. You, you write zero, 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 zero. Then the last is one, one, zero, zero. You invert the bits, you add one. So you get that. And then when you convert to hexadecimal, that is what you get. Okay. So they have to be six digits. You are right. They have to be six digits because six digits, those are hexadecimal bits. Those are hexadecimal digits. They are the ones which give us what? They are the ones which give us, they are the ones which give us uh, 24 bits. Now, Dick, Derek, what well, sooner I think that is not correct. You have how many digits you have? I can see you have 70 digits. They have to be only six because the 70 times the four, that is how much? Hmm? That is 28. Hmm? But here we are saying it should be 24 bits, which is three bytes. So it has to be only six digits okay yeah so one f should be off for dairy how about if i just say the 12 can someone write it 12 if i just say the 12 i think that one is a very simple one someone who can ask you convert it 12 or how will 12 be written as a CKXE number or just a CK number? So, so for negative, sorry, for positive numbers, it is just making that number 24 bits. And then you convert that to hexadecimal. It is as simple as that. So which answer would you give? Hmm? 
No, I'm very good. Okay. Very good. Very good. Okay. Now let us see the answer we will get. Suppose someone says negative 12.5. That means this time we have fractions. Negative 12.5. If you want to write that as a sick XE number, negative 12.5. Can someone tell me how to do it? Of course, you have to convert negative 12.5 to binary. Can you do that first and we see what you get? 12.5, convert it to binary. The first step is to convert the number to binary. Can we do that? You have forgotten? Okay, very good, very good. Okay, so it is 1100.1, okay? Then after that, they are saying here that the fraction is a value between zero and one. So it means that the normal form of these guys, their numbers begin with zero point, zero point. Can we put that into the correct normal form? Zero point. So it will be zero point what? We have to begin with the zero point. Are you working? That 1100.1, I want to normalize it and begin with the zero point something. And then I will have to say times the two to power. I'm waiting.
Come on, guys. I thought that was simple. Nobody can convert that one. Derek, you can't convert that. No, it is not times 10. We say times 2. This is not base 10. So it is times 2 to power what? Power. Power Negative 4. Positive 4. So that is very good. So that is the number you have. <coughs> Remember, it is a negative 0 0.11001 times 2 to power 4. Now, our format there shows that we have to begin with the sign as usual if it is a negative number s is a one if it is a positive s is a zero now the offset is a 10 24 that is what we put into the exponent the offset is 10 24 which means we are going to put there a number there so that when you subtract 10 24 you will remain with the four because that is the power. So the number we are putting in those 11 bits, subtract 10 24 should give us four. So which number should that one be? The number we are going to put into the 11 bits, the exponent. Yeah, you remember how we calculate the exponent. So the number there is in excess of 1024, which means that that number, when you subtract 1024, we should get the exponent we have, which is a four. So if the number is X, Subtract 10 24, you get a 4. So what is x? 10 28. Okay, so that is what we convert to binary. Can you convert that one to binary? 10 28? So which what 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 answer do you get? In binary. Okay. okay. So we can now write the fraction. Remember our s is a one because the number is a negative. Then the exponent we put that number there. One zero 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 zero. It is ending with one zero zero. The total you have to note it should be eleven bits. Okay. Then the fraction last. Then the fraction. Here, the, our fraction is just from the decimal point. 
which is 11001, and we fill the space with the zeros, the remaining space with the zeros. So when you convert that onto hexadecimal, Okay, so I said that you look at the format. The format says that you begin with the sign, the sign bit. The sign bit is a zero if the number is positive, and it is a one if the number is negative. Now, in our case, remember we are the number we are working with is a negative twelve point five, so it means that it is a negative number. So bit number one, which is the sign bit, is a one, okay? Then the next 11 bits, that is the exponent. The number which we have found as the exponent, which is one zero 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 one zero zero. okay? So that is the exponent, next. Okay, the number which we have converted to binary. Okay, then after writing that, then the remaining is the fraction, which should be in 36 bits. Now our fraction, remember when we changed it, it was 0 0.11001. So our fraction is 11001. So that is what you write, 11001. And then you fill the remaining space with the zeros. The total should be 48 bits. The total should be 48 bits. Then you can convert that one to hexadecimal. Is it okay? Brian, is it okay? So not yet. So what is, where, are you, where is the problem? The zeros come after. You remember, you see that fraction there. When you have a fraction, the zeros usually come at the end. That's when they don't have a meaning. But when you put them in front of the decimal point, then they will carry a lot of meaning. So we, we feel the re, we first write our 11001, then we feel the remaining space with the zeros. It's fine, I get. It is, is it a D Naxos? Is it a D there? Can you check again? C04. It is a C. Okay, it is a C. Then remember it is 48 bits. So how many zeros are you adding there? Because that one you get your half a map because I assume that you don't know the total number of bits you are working with. So you have to add so many other zeros. So how many zeros are you going to add after eight? No, these are hexadecimal. You are writing in hexadecimal, okay? 
So how many exades? The total number should be how many digits? How many? What is the total number of hexades, smaller digits? If you have a 48 bits. Okay. So how, how many zeros are you going to add it to that one? Okay, so can you write it again? Okay, can you write it again? I want you to see the full answer. <clears throat> Very good. Very good. So I hope that is clear about the data formats. Okay, if it is an integer, remember it is just written using 24 bits. If it is a neg an integer but a negative number, it is again 24 bits but written as a two z complement number. And if it is a a floating point number, that is the format. You begin with the sign, exponent 11 bits, then the fraction, okay? Now, <clears throat> we have got the instruction formats. Remember the simple seek has got only one format. The simple seek has got only one format, remember? We said that for the simple seek, we have one format which is three bytes. You begin with an opcode, eight bits, then one bit, which is bit number nine, and then 15 bits, that is the address. But now for the extended version, the seek XCE. Charlotte, I don't understand. What, what, what have I just said? What do you want me to repeat? Okay. I think we have done those three examples. First, we said that if someone just says convert 12, we said that you convert it to binary first. Is that right? And then you indicate it in 24 bits just by adding zeros in front. Okay, and then you give your answer as a hexadecimal number. Negative 12, it is the same thing. But yeah, when after writing 12, which was 1100, then you add the zeros in front. Invert the bit, see, add the one. Okay, I think that gave us F, F, F something. Okay, then in negative 12.5, you see how we have been doing it. First, we converted that one to binary and we got 1100.1. .1. We normalized it. That means write it in the correct normal form and we got 0 0.11001 times the two to power four. Then we started the converting. It is a negative number. We said that the first bit is a sign bit, which was a one. Then the exponent, it is a four. We said we have to look for a number which is in excess of 10, 24 by four. We said that was 10, 28. And we converted that one to binary. So that is what we put into the 11 bits. Then for the fraction, we have the 11001. And then we added as many zeros to make that total 36 bits. The total is 48 bits. And we converted that one to hexadecimal and we got the answer which you have given. So I think, I don't know whether there is a problem there. Is there a specific problem?
Okay, very good. Okay, now the instruction formats for the XCE. I was saying that for the simple SIC, remember we saw only one format, opcode, which was eight bits, then bit number nine, which was showing which addressing mode. And we, we saw we had, we had only two addressing modes. And then the 15 bits, which were the, the, what, the address. But here we have got four different formats. We have got four different formats, okay? The first format has got only the opcode. So it means here that we have some instructions, the, C, the XCE, the CKXCE version, has some instructions where you don't need, where you don't need an operand, okay? So it is like someone tells you stand up, yeah? So stand up, you don't need an operand. It says stand up or how, or if I, or if you are, give, you are given a test and I say stop. So that is an instruction which doesn't have a what? An operand. So if we have such instructions where we don't need an operand, we only have an opcode, but we don't have an operand. So the opcode takes eight bits. That is the what for that is what we call a format number one. So for so format one is a format where you don't have any operand. Okay. And the opcode is 8 bits. Then format two is a format which has got two bytes. The opcode is 8 bits. And then it has got two operands, a register and a register. Remember the registers we talked about, they have got codes. Each of those codes, you remember we said is, was a hexadecimal number, which when it converted it to binary, each one is what? Four bits, four bits, okay? So the second format is a format which deals with registers. So you can say add, let me say register S to register T. Opu code is the add. Then you give the first register S, the code for the first register. And then you give the code for the second register, which is a T. So the format number two is a format where operands are registers. Now format number three is a format where the operand is in memory, which means that we have to calculate the target address. We have to calculate the target address to find out the particular memory location we are accessing. Similarly, format four, the operand is also in memory, okay? Now, to explain those bits, I want you to be, to pay a lot of attention. So we have the opcode, this time the opcode is only six bits. It means that the opcode is truncated by two bits because usually like we are going to see it is 80 bits. But if we are going to use the format three or format four, that means if the operand is in your memory, we will truncate some two bits so that we remain with the six bits, okay? Now, let me explain those flags. I want you to be very attentive, okay? Let me begin with the E, E, okay? Flagger E, I hope everybody is seeing it. Now, that flagger E, in most cases, for format three, it is a zero. For format four, it is a one, okay? So that is sometimes how we differentiate whether the format you are using is format three or format four. There are two ways of knowing whether you are using format three or format four. First, format three, like you can see, 
the instruction is three bytes, 24 bits. Because when you count, you have six bits for the opcode, then six bits for the flags, N, e, I, e, X, e, B, P, and e, E, and then 12 bits for the displacement. So that is a total of 24 bits. Guess three bytes. But this one, format 4, it has got the opcode six bits, the flag are six, that is 12 plus 20, 32 bits. So 32 bits, those are four bytes, okay? So that is another way of knowing whether you are dealing with the format three or format four. The first method is to check bit number 12. If bit number 12 is a zero, that would mean format three. If it is a one, that is a format number four. Now let us talk about B and the P, those bits, B and the P. What we are going to see is that here we have got a number of addressing modes. We don't have only two addressing modes like the simple seek. Remember the simple seek has got only two addressing modes, direct and index. And we saw how we calculate the we saw how we calculate the target address. Now here, all of these bits here, these flags are telling us about addressing modes. Now B and P, B is supposed to be maybe referring to base, and P is supposed to be referring to program counter. So we have got a program counter addressing mode. Okay, now if B is a, a one, if B is a one and the P is a zero, can I, uh, can I repeat that one? If B is a one and the P is a zero, that means the base addressing B one, P zero, that means base addressing okay now it means that if you want to get the target address you will take the base register remember we have got register b you take what is in register b and you add what you have in the displacement you take register b and then you add what is in the displacement, okay? So this is what I'm talking about. When B is a one and P is a zero, you take a content of register B plus the displacement. So that calculation will give you the memory location which you are accessing. So that will give you the target address. B a one, P is a zero, take what is in the best register, register B plus the displacement, okay? On the other hand, when B is a zero and the P is a one, then the target address is calculated by taking what is in the program counter plus the displacement. That will give you the what? The target address program counter plus the displacement that will take you to the required memory location, which is the target address. So that is the use of those two flags, B and P. B a one, P is a zero, that means the base addressing, okay? And the base addressing, if we are going to use the base addressing to calculate the target address, you take contents of register B, the base register, plus the displacement. B0, P1 means program counter addressing, which means that you take a contents of the program counter plus the displacement. Okay. Okay. 
Now, if both of those fields are zero, if B is a zero and P is a zero, then it means there is no calculation there. The displacement is the target address. The displacement becomes the target address because you don't have any calculations there, okay? Now, n of those addressing modes, that means we, we either base addressing or program count addressing, we can combine them with the index addressing. Remember index addressing is used when we add the contents of register X. So if BTX is a one, it means we will have also to add the contents of register X. Remember for base addressing, we take what is in register B plus the displacement. But if BTX is also one, then it means you take what is in register B plus what is in register X plus the displacement. In the case X is a one. All the program counter, we said with the program counter, P is a one, B is a zero. And we said that you take what is in the program counter plus the displacement. But in the case BTX is also one, it means you will take the program counter plus contents of register X plus the displacement, okay? Okay, so in that table there, you can see what we mean. The displacement, if B is a zero, do you see that table there at the top? Do you see the table at the top? Hello? Yes, can see. Okay. So you can see that the first one, when B is a zero and P is also a zero, we said that the target address is just what you have in the displacement, okay? But in the case, BTX is a one, then you also have to add what is in register X. When B is a zero and P is a one, that is a program counter. So we calculate the target address by taking contents of the program counter plus the displacement plus what is in register X. But remember, you only add what is in register X only when that bit X is a one. And the B a one, P a zero, that is the base relative, that base addressing. So it means, that you calculate the target address by taking contents of the base register plus the displacement plus contents of register X. But knowing that you only add the contents of register X when BTX is a one, okay? So we have explained these first if the, these bits x b p and the e i think we have explained them okay so those ones are used to calculate the target address now after getting the target address what do we pick because sometimes some problems might need the address itself which you have calculated to be the operand while other cases, you might need to take a content of that particular memory location. If I can give an example, you, have, you can go to a memory location whose address is 12, but it is containing a number 10. So when you are calculating, you calculate the target address and you get 12. Now, for example, if the instruction is to add what is in the accumulator, do you take a 12 or do you take a 10? Remember 12 is the address, but the contents of that particular address is 10. 
So bit C N and the I are the ones which tell us what we are taking. What we are taking, whether we take the address or whether we take the what, or whether we take the contents. Okay. So So here we have bits. If I is a one and N is a zero, if I is a one and N is a zero, we call that one immediate addressing. Mm? It is good that you note even those flags. I means immediate. So when I is one, and the N is zero, that is immediate addressing. So with the immediate addressing, the operand we need is the address, not the contents of the address. But what we take is the what? The address, okay? Now, when I is zero and the N is one, that is the indirect addressing. And you remember, how we explain the indirect addressing. Indirect addressing, you remember we said that you have got a target address and then you have contents of that address. But the contents of that address are pointing to another memory location, okay? So if I can give an example, if you have a pen, you can write, you can have 12 as the address, okay? And then that memory location, 12 has got a number 10. But then there can be another memory location whose address is 10, and this one is containing an eight, okay? So if it is indirect addressing, after using bits B and P to calculate the target address 12, you will get a content solve 12, which is a 10. Then you look for a memory location whose address is 10. And then you take the contents there, which is the eight. <coughs> Excuse me. So that is what we mean by indirect addressing. Okay. When the bits N and the I are both zero, or when they are both ones, then it is the target address, then it is the contents of the target address which we take. So if we calculated the target address and we found that it is a 12, then 10, the contents of the target address is the required operand, is what we take as the operand. So we call that one simple addressing, or you can also call it direct addressing. Now, indexing is not used with the immediate or indirect addressing. So if you have immediate addressing, remember immediate addressing is when n is one, i is one, n is zero, or indirect addressing, you don't indicate, you don't include the x. So whether x is zero or one, you don't add the contents of x, when you are calculating the target address. Okay. So that is what we have in the second table. When N is zero and I is zero, that is a simple addressing. So the contents of the target address is what we take as the operand. But then there is also another constraint there that in case i n is zero and the i is zero, then those the bits b, p, and the e, you include them to the displacement, and they are all taken as address bits. So you don't calculate the target address like we usually do. N is zero, i one, that is immediate. The target address is the operand we take. Any one, I is zero, that is indirect addressing. So the contents of the target address 
is the address of the required operand. And then any one, I1, that is also simple addressing where the contents of the target address is the required operand. Okay. So I beg that we stop here. And then the next time we meet, we are going to consider those examples there to see how we calculate the target address and the contents. Is that okay? Uh, now, I have one question to ask. Uh, the lecture, I, I, I was taking the timetable. Is it a Tuesday or a Wednesday? Because it seems sometimes we have been meeting a Tuesdays. Maybe other times Wednesdays. I'm not sure. What is the correct? Is it Wednesday? It seems it should be a Wednesday. Wednesday. Eh? Wednesday. It is it's Wednesday. Wednesday. Okay. So it is a Wednesday and a Friday, not a Tuesday. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Wednesday and a Friday. Very good. So we meet again on Wednesday then. Okay. Wednesday, Friday. Okay, so the recording I'm going to send. Yeah, I thought I sent the recording on Monday for the Monday. Was it Tuesday lecture? I, think, I thought I did. Um, so if I Tuesday did, lecture, I didn't get it. You haven't. So if yeah, I haven't, have if I haven't, then I'm going to send both. I am going to send them to the email of the class rep, and then you can share. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, please. Have a nice evening. Goodbye. Nice evening. Yeah.